earth became a water world, effectively. It's clearly taught here. This is not some local flood, despite the fact, of course, that many church leaders and theologians, including many evangelicals, will teach otherwise. Water finds its own level. And so it's clearly rather absurd to imagine a local flood that covers mountains. And if local, why would Noah have been commanded to build a vast boat, taking many decades to construct? The obvious reason is that this flood was not a transient event. It was a devastating event. It was something that was going to last over a year, as you read in scripture. People and animals could have easily migrated from the area. And it's interesting the Lord Jesus Christ believed and taught that this flood was real history. He says in Matthew 24 these words, As in the days that were before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Again notice Jesus' words here, all people outside the ark perished. And in fact it's crystal clear that the events of Genesis chapters 6, 7, 8 and 9 are treated as real history, not just by Christ, but by all the New Testament writers. That, I think, is beyond uh, debate. Here's another evidence of catastrophism. This is a fossil I found close to 10 years ago. I was walking in the area of Kings Barns on the coast near St Andrews, an area which I think is now a golf course. You couldn't go there today, but there's a little piece of the old red sandstone, if you're interested in geology, a little outlier there, and uh, it's a very friable rock. You can you can almost rip bits out with your bare hands, and in it are these flattened and charred stems, basically. They, this indicates to me that they would have been ripped up, buried, and charred by the presence of volcanism at the same time. So you've got to imagine volcanic activity taking place, but with lots of water present. Exactly the type of thing we, we expect would have happened during the flood. So they're flattened, they're carbonised. You can rub these and, off, and charcoal effectively comes off in, on your fingers. So hot sediments, volcanic ash, but a watery environment. Interestingly, we know from the fossil record that there have been hollow stemmed uh, plants, sometimes called lycopods, which may have even been part of the floating forest that Dominic alluded to earlier uh, in the pre-flood world. We know these have existed. People have done reconstructions of lycopods and they seem to be the sort of things you find in the old red sandstone, conventionally believed to be hundreds of millions of years old, but I believe these are wonderful evidence for the pre-flood environment. Here you even see, and I'm not, again I'm not dogmatic, but the, the uh, central uh, vascular bundle perhaps that would have carried the xylem and the phloem for carrying the water and the sugars respectively through the plant. Anchored in the middle of the stem to keep it in a central location by those uh, sort of cross struts I'm calling them. Um, the point of this is that this is wonderful preservation. You don't need a PhD in, the, in paleontology, the study of fossils, to work out that stems of this kind must be buried quickly. Plants rot away very quickly. Plant tissue rots incredibly quickly. So here you've got something in the presence of hot sediments, ash perhaps, and water and cementing agents, and the whole thing's gone hard and preserve these details. This kind of rapid burial of a lot of plant material speaks eloquently and compellingly of catastrophism. Water, inundating land, and the presence of volcanic activity. Again, consistent with the Noachic flood. Many rivers, after travelling along a valley, will suddenly appear to turn, from our point of view, and flow through a narrow gorge that cuts across some major barrier, like a, a ridge of land or a plateau or even a mountain range. And we call those resulting gorges or valleys water gaps. And you can see one at the top there uh, where the Shoshone River, uh, starting at Yellowstone National Park in the USA, flows east straight through the Rattlesnake Mountains as if they weren't there. But what's fascinating is that that river could easily have continued in a slightly more southerly route, gone round the mountains, where you see that low point on the slide at the bottom with the marked X. It's only a couple of miles away, and yet it didn't do that. 
It's a complete mystery why this Shoshone River should have continued eastward, oblivious as it were, to the mountainous obstacle in its way, cutting this incredible gorge. Clearly rivers do not flow uphill. But how could it have done so then? Here's another one. The Delaware Water Gap is probably the most famous one uh, if you were to study this. And you can clearly see in the schematic at the left-hand side showing a sort of topographical 3D view of a map and also the actual picture of the Delaware Water Gap uh, how nice that looks. It's a, a lovely little feature. The deepest water gaps you see in the world are in the Himalayas. There are 11 major rivers that start in the northern Tibeto, uh, sorry, the southern Tibetan plateau and then plunge south straight through the Himalayas uh, in deep gorges. There's one that is almost four miles deep, about six kilometres deep, the Aran River flowing past south, uh, south past Mount Everest. A huge water gap, a deep gorge. Here's one flowing near Washington, USA, and it's cut straight through an anticline. That's where rocks, uh, sedimentary rocks, have been pushed up in a ridge. And uh, you can see a little inset picture of an anticline there. And you've got to imagine a river's cut through that. So water gaps are a mystery to uniformitarian geologists or actualists, people who argue for millions of years, because they cannot work out how a river would erode uphill but why then does it seem to cut across a barrier, a formidable obstacle? There are various ideas, antecedent drainage, ancient drainage, that somehow was already there and it kept pace with uplift. But there are many different uh, models of, of trying to explain water gaps, perhaps even five of them, which compete with one another. The reason there are so many is because none of them really satisfy or really explain the evidence. But I believe that the biblical geological model of Taz Walker is very helpful here. I've already mentioned the recessive stage of the flood. We're imagining that part of the flood where the floodwaters would have been draining off the emerging continents into the newly forming ocean basins. First of all, the abative phase, then abative phase, and then the dispersive phase. And I think that's key to understanding the features of planation and water gaps that we've looked at. The mountains rose up, remember, and the valley sank down, Psalm 104, verse 8. And so the water would have flowed as enormous sheets producing many planation surfaces, and then as the water continued to abate and new land was emerging beneath the floodwaters with earth movements, with tectonic activity, mountain folding, then there would have been a more channelised flow and they would have cut, in some cases, across those features that we see. And so here we are going to look at a little schematic in four stages to try to get you to picture this. Abative phase of the flood, the sheet phase of the flood, in other words, water flowing off the land in great sheets. And as we continue through this uh, schematic, the water flow is reducing now. It's a little bit shallower. And as you continue, you see these, uh, these sheets of water become shallower and then they become more channelised. And that's the dispersive phase of the flood. And then as we continue, we have the water now exposing land to view. Channelization here has the potential to erode valleys, to erode gorges, and because there's massive energy involved. There's a tremendous amount of energy in fast-moving water carrying a sediment load, in this case, uh, including large rocks and so on, as we mentioned earlier. And then as we continue through the sequence, we have the last stage, which I've depicted here, where the mountain ranges that we see today begin to appear. When you find a, a, a surface, by the way, cut with a valley, which is then effectively hovering way above the water table, we call that a wind gap, because only wind passes through it today. That's a similar sort of feature. So uh, flow that's perpendicular to a barrier that's being raised up, which, but which is highly energetic, is able to then cut across that barrier. And as that barrier continues to be lifted and the waters continue to cut down, then the river that you see today is occupying a valley that was cut by fast-moving water, not cut by the river. The rocks and their fossil record then need not be understood as the remains of millions of years. Indeed, I would say they cannot be understood as the remains of millions of years in a way that's consistent with Scripture and with an understanding of the Gospel because the fossil record represents death and bloodshed and suffering. And though, therefore these long ages of time that, that some people argue before Adam undermine the Christian gospel, which make clear that death is a consequence of Adam's sin and ours. And it's not something, therefore, that would have preceded 
that very good declaration of God at the time of his creation being completed on day six. And in Genesis 1.31 we read God's words, very good. No, the rocks and the fossils speak powerfully, I believe, of the flood of Noah and perhaps some local catastrophism since. And of the flood judgment of God because of man's sin and rebellion. And Noah's flood explains those evidences very well. It's a wonderful picture is the ark of Noah of the salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ who provided a way of escape in those antediluvian times and does for us today through Christ.